Okay, so you're here for some great church leadership content. The podcast is great, but there's also another piece of content you need to be enjoying each week. It is the Leading Saints email newsletter. Now I get it. Email newsletters feel so 2006, you know, but it isn't as old fashioned as you might think. It's actually one of the most popular pieces of content that Leading Saints produces. Each week, I share a unique leadership thought that can only be found in the newsletter. I keep it short and sweet. Most can read it in less than five minutes. And then we share with you recent content you might have missed, throwback episodes, and Leading Saints events that happen more often than you might anticipate. If you want to make sure you are on the email list, simply visit leadingsaints.org 14. That's leadingsaints.org 14. That will also get you 14 days access to our full library of content not available to the general public. So look for Leading Saints in your inbox by going to leadingsaints.org 14 or click the link in the show notes. So my name is Kurt Frankum, and I am the founder and executive director of Leading Saints and obviously the host of the Leading Saints podcast. Now, I started Leading Saints back in 2010. It was just a hobby blog, and it grew from there. By the time uh, 2014 came around, we started the podcast, and that's really when it got some uh, traction and took off. Uh, 2016, we became a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we've been growing ever since. And now I get the opportunity of an of interviewing and talking with remarkable people all over the world. Now, this is a segment we do on the Leading Saints podcast called How I Lead. And we reach out to everyday leaders. They're not experts, gurus, authors, PhDs. They're just everyday leaders who've been asked to serve in a specific leadership calling. And we simply ask them, how is it that you lead? And they go through some remarkable principles that should be in a book, that should be behind a PhD. They're, uh, they're usually that good. And uh, we just talk about uh, sharing what the other guy's doing. And I remember being a leader, just simply wanting to know, okay, I know what I'm trying to do, but what's the other guy doing? What's working for him? And so that's why every Wednesday or so, we publish these How I Lead segments to share. This is an epic episode. We're headed down to Central America, to Honduras, to talk with Carla Fonseca. How are you, Carla? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is cool. I guess you uh, you email, emailed me a while ago. Uh, you were not looking to be interviewed by any means, <laughs> but uh, you were telling me a little about your experience in Honduras as, as a leader and uh, a few emails back and forth. And here we are doing an interview. Are you, you ready for this? Uh, I'm a little bit nervous. I know you have a large audience, so but I'll do my best. Oh, cool. Well, I'm really excited to learn about the church in Honduras and, and your personal experience. And so are you born and raised in Honduras? I was born and raised here. Yes. Nice. And did you just learn English just growing up in school? or? Uh, actually, no, but my parents enrolled me in English classes since I was a little girl. I think I may have been like eight or nine. And then I... I I mean, I guess I have a gift for it because I, it turned out to be <laughs> good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, cool. I'm excited that they did that so that we can have this conversation yes. today. Now, I <laughs> Spanish to some degree, but uh, ever since my mission, I've lost quite a bit of it. So we better stick with English for, for this. <laughs> so. Good. So um, now the other thing I want to ask you about is uh, how, how did you come across Leading Saints and how long have you been listening? I've been listening for almost two years. Uh, There is an influencer I follow on Instagram. And in one of her stories, she mentioned your podcast and having listened to the episode. So I was intrigued. And I'm a big podcast listener. So I I looked you up and I loved it. And and I've been hooked (laughs) ever since. Yes. Nice. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, just the church where you live, um, as far as the, the demographics, uh, what it's like going to church. I mean, all those things. 
Well, um, I'm not very familiar with the entire story. I know sure. that my parents who were baptized when I was three or four, I can remember, I, I was really young. Uh, they were among like uh, among the pioneers. Uh, maybe they were uh-huh. baptized um, when the church was r- relatively new. So I guess that would make the church like 50 or 60 years old here in Honduras. And uh, I live in the second largest city in Honduras, which is San Pedro Sula. But this is where the, the missionaries first came when they came to Honduras. And um, we have about six states in the metropolitan area and others in, in the towns around. We are the, the industrial capital. So there's a lot of, of members here in town. Our temple is being built and it's supposed to be finished yeah. next year. So uh, we're hoping early 2024 we'll have our own temple. Right now we have to travel to drive four hours to get to the temple in the capital city. in the city. Wow. Mm-hmm. Wow. D- did you expect to get a second temple there? Was that quite a surprise? That was quite a surprise. And uh, I-, I can't even... If I start remembering what it was like when we heard the announcement in general conference, I'm going to start crying. But we were so yeah. excited. And we really try not to scream for joy because <laughs> President Nelson did tell us to hold back, but we wanted to so bad. Yeah. But yeah. Were, were you in a in a chapel listening to the conference at the time no, or we were, were you we home? We were at or? home. Yeah, but we still okay. wanted to be obedient. <laughs> nice. nice. Well, I say if you're at home, you can cheer as long as you want. So. <laughs> oh, I've been screaming ever since. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Awesome. So uh, how long will it take you to get to the temple once the oh, new temple is built? I'll drive for like 10 minutes, maybe 15. So we're really oh, wow. excited. Wow. What a blessing. That's cool. Does this. Nice. Now, and if I remember right, you were just recently released as your ward primary president. Is that right? I haven't yet. Uh, I'm, oh, okay. I, I attend a very small ward, and it's not my ward. Uh, we just found out in August that I am two blocks away from the ward boundaries. So oh, I really? had to so, be released. I have to be released. Oh, my released. goodness. But this is a small ward, and basically the entire presidency, but for one of my counselors, has to be released as well. So mm-hmm. we haven't found our replacements yet. Um, Interesting. Okay. But I will be moving back to my ward in, in January because I need my temple recommend renewed and and. I, I have to go and uh, it pains me and it hurts so much. <laughs> it hurts so bad, but um, I'll go where you want me to go. Right. So, Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe just talk about your, the dynamics of uh, your word there. I mean, is it where, have you been over a, a large primary or what, anything notable about the, the ward? Like I said, it's a very small ward. So mm-hmm. it's, um, it's a it's a huge geographic area. It goes even to the border with our neighboring country in Guatemala. But most of the membership is it's in the mountains. So we are in mm-hmm. the suburbs, very close to the mountains, and then there are a lot of na- of, of I don't know even settlements urban settlements Mm -hmm. in the mountain that started out illegally and with time have become, uh, you know, recognized as as settlements. So most of our membership is up there. And we, in a very small percentage of the the members in our ward, live in the suburbs, just under the mountains. And Mm -hmm. I lived in, in, in Denver for a while. So actually the mountains here do remind me a lot of the Rockies. Um, so, but okay. that's, that's just to give you an idea of how it looks. And, and, and so we have to go up the mountain to visit the most of the members. So uh, our primary is very small in our goods on our good Sundays. We have like two dozen kids, but of, of those two dozen, only two or three, including my son are, are down here and, the rest of them are up there in in the mountain, and yeah. that's how it goes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And was this your your first go at uh, being a primary president? Yes. I mean, I've been a member my entire life and I've been serving and calling ever since I came back from my mission. And I had uh-huh. never worked in primary before until I was called last year. Oh, wow. That's great. And um, and then anything, uh, is there a story to how you were called or what you remember from that? Does um, it surprise yes. you? Yes. Oh, there's a yeah. story there. <laughs> Um, yeah, let's hear it. So I had at the time last at this time last year, I had two state callings. I still do, um, but uh, for reasons out of their control, we didn't have a primary president in in the world after we came back from the pandemic. And so, but I I just didn't care. I, I, I to be honest, I didn't. I figured my mm. son was being taken care of uh, by whoever was in charge. Um, but one day I went and I noticed that they were doing nothing and they only had one sister looking over all of them and they were just like coloring, uh, on the floor and stuff. And so I asked the bishop if I could help the primary with the music. I'm a self-learned musician. Uh, and so I said, uh, can I help? And he said, yeah, please. And so I started <laughs> helping with the music. However, I've never thought of myself as very crafty or creative, so I don't really do things with my hands. And so I, and I, it was an assignment. So I wasn't really putting my heart into it. I, I read the handbook in a hurry and I was doing um, a very poor job of teaching the music, but hey, I, at least I thought I was doing my part. And a couple of times uh, the bishop asked me if I wanted to be the primary president. And I said, well, not only did I not want to, I, I had an excuse. I said, I have two state callings, and so I can't. Um, so they <laughs> called someone else, and she called to, her two counselors were two recent converts, like months, months old converts. And so um, it happened a, a few times that nobody would come, and it was just me. And I had no idea how to handle primary. I couldn't, I, I never taught, I never seen a primary class taught other than when I was in primary, right? That was so mm-hmm. long ago. And the bishop kept asking me, do you want to be the president? And so I felt like this, this is my son we're talking about and I don't want him to be having this primary experience. It can be so fun, primary can be great. So I talked to the state presidency state president included, and I told them what the situation was, and I asked to be released from one of those callings. I mean, um, they're not leadership callings per se. We, I, I'm, I'm the self-reliance specialist and the history mm-hmm. specialist. So can you release for me from one of them and I can, so I can take on the primary and the ward? And uh, they say, okay, we're going to counsel uh, together and see what we decide and uh yeah they decided not to and wow so so more more of responsibility to your load there and i still i still felt like the primary needed help so i in december no end of the uh, end of november last year i went to the bishop and said you know what if you still need me as primary president just go ahead and call me and, and I could see the hope and the joy in his eyes. Can I call you? I'm like, yes, you can. <laughs> uh, and, and I'll see how I deal with all of the loads, right? And I was called and I was uh, by myself in all through December. And mid-January, I call, we, we finally call uh, one of our counts, one of my counselors. And the week after we called the second one. And in June, July, we finally call a secretary, and and it's been just the four of us. But uh, wow! But yeah, that's wow. the story. So was there calling counselors and whatnot? Were, were there very many options, or did you there have to take the same role as yours? Yeah. And again, that's why I haven't been <clears> released <throat> yet because there are mm-hmm. no options, and it's just one of my counselors who lives in the area, and she is bound to be the primary president, but they cannot find anyone else to support her. You know, a lot of the sisters and even the brothers are not really excited about working in primary. And so it's very hard to find someone who can and who will work in primary. And 
And I, I'm actually yeah. a, a little concerned because I have to live in a couple of weeks and and I don't want to I don't want to leave her alone, but um, I, I don't have a choice. Yeah. Now these are just some of the the realities, right? The messiness of sometimes church leadership when we're a lay leadership and, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we just need people to step up and help or, or maybe, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, it's a small ward, right? And, and there's just not en enough human resources to sometimes feel the callings like maybe they do in Sandy, Utah, you know, exactly. so. you know, because of, of where we live. And again, I, I explained to you how, how most of the membership lives they mm -hmm. don't have a lot of education and mm -hmm. so most people believe that that in that hinders them from performing in a calling as they need mm -hmm. to and so most of the sisters that go to our work could have callings but they don't yeah mm -hmm. interesting yeah that's tough and uh you know we you just plow forward and, and hope that the Lord provides a way. Exactly. So, well, as, as we do in these, how I lead episodes, uh, I asked you to maybe send me a few principles that we could reflect on that have helped you in your service. And so let's go through those and, and I'd love to hear any stories or experiences or examples that come to mind as we go through this. So the first one is seek help from others. And uh, we sort of touched on that already, but uh, what else would you add to that? Well, like I said, I've never worked in primary before. So when mm -hmm. I finally got the calling and I felt the authority, the mantle on me, I felt the pressure to perform this time. So I knew I had to do a good job. And, and I went to the handbook and I read it cover to cover the part about primary, but I still felt like I needed more. So I logged in Facebook and started searching for primary groups in Spanish uh -huh. and in English. And I researched, I spent days researching and I loved, and I joined so many groups, I can't even keep count. And not yeah. just for, for primary leaders and presidents, I also look for music leaders. Because I'm telling you, I, I've been a, a member of the church my entire life. So I went through the whole primary program I can't remember one single lesson, but I do remember the music, like all of the songs. Like I know that primary soundbook cover to cover, and it's not because, <laughs> I, and I didn't learn it as an adult. I learned it as a child. So I knew sure. the importance of music for children. And so I, and I knew I had to do a good job if I wanted them to learn. So I found this amazing group, and if there are any music leaders in that in the audience, they they will know, they will recognize the name Charlotte Dance, and so I follow her and I studied her method. Oh yeah, she has science behind it, and it's amazing. You should interview her. Find yeah, her. no, it's she's been recommended a few times. And <laughs> she's on my list. So awesome. Charlotte, if you're listening, uh, let's <laughs> let's make this happen. So you're 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 all down in Honduras. Uh, she's amazing. And we don't have the resources nice. to buy her book. She has a book. We don't have the resources for that, but I, I gobble on all of her free oh. and online content. And Well, Carla, I will make sure Leading Saints has some resources and we exist to help oh. leaders. So we will get you what you need. So. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So I, I, I just log into their Facebook page. She has a YouTube channel. I, I devoured <laughs> everything and I, I'm still perfecting the method, but I've been implementing it since, since January. And it, it has helped my children love music time. And so hmm. I'm glad I've been, I've been, uh, getting help from others, not, not just here in Honduras or in Latin America, but also in the United States. And then I also had to ask my state residency to come and help. And you don't know me, but I'm, I'm, I'm very proud to be proud. Uh, so I don't like asking for help and I boasting my self-reliance. So for me to ask the state presidency to come and help me because I had no idea what I was doing, that took a lot of effort, but I did. And, yeah. and they would come almost every Sunday. They would teach my lessons so I could see how to teach a, a primary lesson. They would take over music time so I could see how to do it properly because I wasn't doing it right. 
And they were with me uh, the first month and part of the second one, even as, as our counselors started, to, as we started working together as a presidency, because uh, my counselors uh, didn't have primary experience either. So uh, yeah, we were all new to it. And so um, we were able to pull forward and we took it step by step after that. So the whole primary was just non-existent, the program itself. So we started taking it one step at a time. And I don't know if this could, I didn't list it as a principle, but that's how it worked for us. And that's how I use it in my in my field, I'm an engineer, so I take on projects and that's how we do it. We go step by step, we define priorities and, and that's how we went. So we first started dividing the kids into two groups, seniors and juniors. We decided we didn't have resources to, to, to open the nursery. So we have the nursery together with the junior primary and it's a little distracting, but at least it's, it's better than having them all together. And so we started yeah. dividing. And so I would teach music. One of my counselors would, would teach junior and the other would teach senior primary. So we were not only the presidency, we were also the teachers. And then we we brought, after that, after that had been settled, we started with the children and youth program. So we prepared to launch it. We had to learn again how the program worked. And so again, we started researching and finding out what others were doing and, and asking people online because no one in our world had a lot of experience with primary. So we had to ask outside. And uh, again, our state presidency was very helpful. And we launched the program in April and we had our first activities day uh, in May. And we were so nervous and excited at the same time because we had never done this. Um, and, and, and we did a family history related activity and all of the children came and it was a huge success. We, I mean, seriously, the world was excited because this was the first time that the primary ever held an activity. And so, and we invited all of the kids, not just the, the senior primary. We also invited the young ones and we had activities for them in another room while we were working in family history with, with the old ones. And, and that's how we went. And so, um, we were, there were only three of us, but in reality, we were not alone. We were getting a lot of help from others. Well, yeah. Wow. I mean, yeah, you're, you're handling it all, right? Not just being in the presidency, but you're all the primary teachers as well, you know? So, and I just love that concept of you realize you needed help. And so you went online and looked for some resources, mm-hmm. found some Facebook groups, Charlotte dance, you found leading saints, you've, and then also turned locally to the local leaders, making sure that you got some help there. And that's yes. sometimes harder. It's easy to say that, but sometimes it's hard to ask for that help. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next uh, principle is work together with the ward council. This is always intriguing as how organizations work with their ward council to uh, find success. So how how did that experience go for you? One thing that is very unique to our ward, and I'm saying to my ward, but it's probably more general than, than I believe it to be, is that we have a lot of kids that come to church alone. Um, So they either walk from their homes or take a bus and they get to church. And I mean, they were having so much fun that they would come even if their parents didn't. And we also had some friends, you know, that's how they call it today when they're not members of the church and neither are their parents, but they were having so much fun that they were coming to to the meetings by themselves. They would come into the activities by themselves. And so um, we had, there's, there was only three of us for a time. And so, uh, they didn't even have someone to sit in sacrament with. And I had my son and, and, and my family with me, but I would take a couple of them and my, my counselors would take others. And, and, and then we had to start asking every week in our ward council others to help us. And then we had issues with one of our kids um, who got bitten up and had an activity by some kids who were not on our list and who we really didn't know. And so his mother oh, was wow. of course very upset and 
uh, she stopped bringing them to church. And these were the kids, some of the kids that would come by themselves, but they wouldn't come uh, anyway. I mean, I guess she, she wouldn't let them come to church. And so we, we, uh, we brought up the issue many, many times within the ward council meetings. And we asked the Relief Society to help us with the sister. We asked the missionaries to visit the family as much as they could. We asked the elders quorum uh, to visit mm. them as much as they could. And so uh, at one point they were getting a lot of visits, not just from us, but from everyone in our council. And and eventually after, and it was actually the ward family history consultant who eventually brought the kids back. She organized a family history activity and she brought the, those kids back. There were three of them. So she brought them back to an activity and we were so excited to see them once again after a month of not being in church. Um, and, and funny thing is, or not funny actually, two weeks after, the, after they came back to church, uh, their house burned down. There was no oh, one no. home, so wow. no one got hurt. But again, ward council emergency meeting, and everyone just got together. And what we, because we were thinking of the children, of course. There's three children in that in that family, but uh, we also had to think about bringing them uh, back up, you know. And so, and and again, I told you that these members don't have a lot. Um, a lot of financial resources, but the whole ward council just came together and they were giving what out of what little they have. And this family came back. Uh, they wouldn't, they, the kids wouldn't come for another month because they had no clothes. They felt bad about coming to church in shorts and t-shirts. So again, we got together and figure out how to get them shirts and pants so they could come. And they're back. Uh, two of those kids are moving on to young men next month. And we're very excited. We feel as a presidency that they are very strong and sweet spirits. So mm. we wonder if all of these happenings are just uh, trials or the adversary's attempts to to hold them back because they're going to be, I mean, I was looking at them yesterday at church and I'm like, are, is this going to be our future bishop? Because um, yeah. he's been going through so much and yet he continues to persevere and he's an amazing boy and so are his siblings. And so we are so grateful that we can always go to the ward council and ask for the things that we need for the children. I mean, the children, they they need they need their parents to to function well, and so and that's why we need the help of. We actually, as a primary, we need to work with the work council. We cannot work by ourselves. It's not going to work. No matter how many times we visit the kids by ourselves, we need to also visit the parents, and 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 that's why we work together with them. Yeah, no, what a great example. And, um, you know, just the, because you're going to see things as a primary president, you know, maybe issues or concerns with a particular family and then just sort of rally the, the word council around that family. And, and, you know, look, you know, with hindsight, it, it worked out beautifully and, yes. and you were such a support there. And, and now they'll, they're hopefully finding encouragement in the gospel because of that. Yeah. And this is just one example. I'm giving you a story. I like to, to tell my experience in stories, but yeah, yeah. I mean, the countless times that they have come that that they have come forward to help us with the children it's just amazing and and we're yeah. very glad to belong to it and to have that that group of leaders working together for the betterment of the entire membership mm -hmm. anything else with uh, in relation to working with the ward council that would be worth mentioning um, there are a lot, there are always a lot of negotiations going on, but you know, we love it. <laughs> sure. We are a very, uh, tight ward, uh, really council meetings feel more like family councils. Sometimes we make a lot of jokes and we just feel, uh, like seriously, like 
this is family yeah. just meeting together. I mean, we're just missing lunch sometimes. We do meet after after a meeting, so it's actually it's it's around noon when we meet. But, nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. Third principle is visualize the potential in the children. Uh, tell, tell me more about that. I, I started doing this when I was serving my mission. And whenever I, and I started doing this like six months into it, I would feel a little disappointed with some of our investigators. We call them investigators back then. I know they don't call them that anymore. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And so I started, someone, I, I, probably one of my companions mentioned this, start seeing them like that, what they can be instead of what they are now. And so I started, mm -hmm. and it worked for the rest of my mission. And then I just couldn't get it out of my head. Uh, but I would start teaching someone and I, I served my mission in Guatemala. So again, another poor country. And so the people that we were teaching were um you know, you've heard the stories, drunks on the street, homeless people, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I started seeing them in white on their baptismal day. Uh, day. And, and it worked. It, it helped me have so much faith in the process and, and to invite the spirit into my efforts to teach these people. And I've forgotten about that. Mm. And as I was starting to teach the children, I have to admit, I didn't really feel a lot for them as, as, as I started serving in my calling. But the feeling and I guess the mantle of the calling started opening my heart. And I started seeing these kids in the future. And I don't have to look that far ahead. I can see eight months, eight years ahead and see this, all of these kids as missionaries. And yeah. as our leaders in the future, and I, I really, truly do see them. Like I said, like I mentioned about this kid, he's, I, I love that kid with all my heart. That boy who was beaten up at, at, at a church activity. And then a month yeah. later, his house was burned down. Yet he mm. continues to be there. And he has so much energy and so much love for the gospel. And I, I can't stop seeing him like a future priesthood and a, a powerful priesthood leader. Yeah, what well, that's inspiring. That's and really cool. I'm just really glad that I had I had a year to touch his heart. And I pray that I made an impact. However small it was, I pray that I do. And 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 this is one of them. We have over 20 children and I love them all equally. Um and, and, and yes, I remember before I went on my mission, I got my patriarchal blessing a few days before. And the patriarch said, you're going to meet some very important people on your mission. So I was very excited. I'm like, oh, am I going to meet the president or someone all no, important? <laughs> Yet I, 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 I didn't. I didn't. And so when I came back from my mission, I realized, you know what? The people that I met and that I taught are very important. And I have come to realize now after 16 months of serving as primary president that those kids, however old they are, even the three-year-olds, they are incredibly important. And, and we are glad that, uh, particularly in my case, I have a bishop who sees their importance as well. The bishops are usually counseled to focus on the youth. However, our bishop always tells me I focus on the children and the youth because they are the future. It's not just the youth. I have to look after the children as well. And I love him for that. Uh, That's so cool. I, I love that my bishop thinks that way too, that they are important. They are very important. And that's how it went. Yeah. Wow, Carla, this has been so fun to, to chat with you and, and to uh, and be inspired by some of these principles and the way that you've led. Well, I hope uh, some something in the universe takes me to Honduras and uh, I'd love to Yay. visit that beautiful land. I've heard great things and I'm sure the food is phenomenal. So uh, We'd love to <laughs> I'd love to visit you. sometime. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, last question I have for you, Carla, is as you reflect on your time as a leader, how has being a leader helped you become a better follower of Jesus Christ? It has helped me understand, like I said before, that everyone is important. And 
if you had asked me this last December, I mean, we don't have to go that far, I wouldn't have given much thought to the primary kids. But after, after all of this, I realized that everyone is important, even, even and especially those who are so little that they need us to advocate for them. So, uh, teaching or, or serving children and, and, and pretty much uh, every other group, which has been my experience so far, has taught me that love is the most important thing. So, if I serve with love, I serve the best and, and I become more and more like our Savior. And that concludes this How I Lead interview. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I would ask you, could you take a minute and drop this link in an email, on social media, in a text, wherever it makes the most sense, and share it with somebody who could relate to this this experience. And this is how we how we develop as leaders, just hearing what the other guy's doing, trying some things out, testing, adjusting for your area. And uh, that's that's where great leadership's discovered, right? So we would love to have you uh, share this with uh, somebody in this calling or a related calling, and that would be great. And also, if you know somebody, uh, any type of leader, who would be a fantastic guest on the How I Lead segment, uh, reach out to us. Go to leadingsaints.org slash contact. Maybe send this in individual an email, letting them know that you're going to be suggesting their name for this interview. We'll reach out to them. And... Uh, See if we can line them up. So again, go to leadingsaints.org slash contact, and there you can submit all the information and let us know. And maybe they will be on a future How I Lead segment on the Leading Saints podcast. And remember, to get on the email newsletter list, simply go to leadingsaints.org slash 14. It came as a result of the position of leadership which was imposed upon us by the God of heaven who brought forth a restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when the declaration was made concerning the own and only true and living church upon the face of the earth, we were immediately put in a position of loneliness. The loneliness of leadership from which we cannot shrink nor run away, and to which we must face up with boldness and courage and ability.